uh, Jeffrey McDaniel. This is his fifth book, Jeffrey McDaniel's uh, fifth book of, of poems. Uh, he's a professor at Sarah Lawrence College, and almost 30 years ago uh, now, he was uh, my student in a, in a class there as a freshman. In fact, just last week, uh, we read a couple of poems. I teach poems of his every semester, and we read one of your first poems ever, uh, The uh, Boy Inside the Turtle, uh, which I think you wrote as a freshman, maybe a sophomore, sophomore. 19, 20 years old. This is his uh, fifth book. Jeffrey has uh, the, the extraordinary gift of, of metaphor, of making metaphor. It's the only thing, uh, Socrates or Aristotle said this, that cannot be taught in, in poetry. It's a quintessential poetic uh, tool, cannot be taught, and his ability to do it is unlike any other I've ever heard. Hello. The person gazing at this page before you had really amazing eyes. Blue the way the Caribbean is blue, that first minute off the plane to someone who grew up in New Jersey. Anyway, it's good you're here. The truth is I've been lonely, crawling up and down the page at night. Life is like this boomerang. You get hurled out and, and everything is fresh. Then you hit 40 and start to arc back to the hand that flung you from the womb, the Lord's hand. And then it's all rerun. I know I'm complaining and that it's unattractive, but please forgive me because complaining is like sex for old people. <laughs> Have you ever cringed with your whole body, been so filled with shame you wanted to wriggle out of your flesh like a serpent in a forest, like the snake that betrayed Eve? No one ever mentions how the snake apologized, how he tried to make it up to them, how the Lord punished the snake too, said I will fill your kind with so much shame and self-hatred you will writhe out of yourself every six, men six months just like a man's <coughs> penis. It's true, twice a year men wake and find nothing in their boxers <laughs> but the empty casings of their runaway fallacies. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> In 1875, a Civil War vet from Virginia gets off a boat in England. Everyone calls him Yankee. He cringes and snarls, I ain't no Yankee, I killed Yankees. But after a month, he begins to take it. The way we all begin to take the gray hairs in our underpants, the ring of our anus loosening our rocket ship struggling to pierce the atmosphere. Now if you would just lean forward a little, friend, and drag your fragrant strands over my voluptuous grief. Very nice to be here. Wonderful readings, Vivek and John. Uh, I'll read one old love poem from many moons ago. In an effort to get people to look into each other's eyes more, and also to appease the mutes, the government has decided to allot each person exactly 167 words per day. When the phone rings, I, I put it to my ear without saying hello. In the restaurant, I point at chicken noodle soup. I'm adjusting well to the new way. Late at night, I call my long distance lover, proudly say, I only used 59 today. 
I saved the rest for you. When she doesn't respond, <laughs> I know that she's used up all her words. <laughs> so I slowly whisper, I love you, I love you, I love you. 32 and a third times. <laughs> After that, we just sit on the line and listen to each other breathe. I have some Philadelphia poems, but I don't really feel like taking you into that mess quite yet. <laughs> but I guess the bow has been bent, so we'll make from the shaft. Maybe I'll drink a glass of water. No, I'll read a love poem. No, not really a love poem. This is a poem. Anybody here ever been to Guatemala? been to Tikal. Tikal is a great uh, ruin in Guatemala and I went there when I was in grad school. T -t Tonight is kind of like a little bit like this is your life. My friend Chuck who I used to live with 21 years ago in grad school is here. Um, my friend Alex Close uh, who I have a poem about his brother is here from my neighborhood and Tom was my first teacher and um, you know uh, Tom you could you could make a case that Tom uh, not only did he, you know, change my life, but he, you know, um, very well could have saved my life in, in many ways, uh, we could say. The relationship between a teacher and a student is so per personal and private, and yet uh, seeing Tom here and also at Sarah Lawrence for so many years, he's affected so many lives. Um, you know, he's impacted so many people in a positive way, and, uh, but I can only speak for myself in some ways and just say that I love you and uh, thanks. For everything. Um, so this is a poem about kind of going back to Guadalajara. I went there in uh, 91 and uh, had a very different experience and I was a different person. So it's about kind of going back to the same place, to this ruin, and trying to make sense of it all. Of these two, these two halves of me. Return to El Mundo Perdido. Touching the limestone of the pyramid's flat roof at noon. I look for an indent, a smudge, a fingerprint, some residue of the old me. Thirteen years ago, a six-pack, weed, a pocket full of pharmaceuticals, two gringas from San Diego. Instead of the sun, it was the moon, another log thrown on the bonfire of my senses. Howler monkeys serenading, stars crackling in all directions, nature's chandelier. I wanted something authentic, something I could feel in my bones. Now on top of the same pyramid, in a Mayan city swallowed down the jungle's green throat a thousand years ago, I stare out at a giant saba, its top branches covered in a fur-like substance erupting out like spider arms. So it looks as if a tarantula has mated with the tree. I'm searching for a metaphor to connect the old and new me. My wife of two weeks and I walk the Tika forest, clear pearls of sweat jeweling our foreheads, a throng of monkeys frenzying between limbs barely resembles me and my teenage friends on a street corner drinking binge. The freshly shed skin of a mud-colored snake one quarter reminds me of the life I wriggled out of. An ocelot nimble on a branch like how my id purred. Ah, none of these metaphors are working. Then I see a tree a strangler fig, ficus aria, prince of the dark forest, literally enveloping another, coiling the length of its trunk, its roots shooting up and down, choking the life out. Um, has anyone ever seen one of those trees? It's like the strangler fig, it will just envelop a, tr a healthy tree 
and just, uh, it's like this vine that will suck its heart out. It was really strange. It seemed like a metaphor for drug addiction somehow. Anyway, okay. We're now we're getting to the happy Philadelphia poems. There's some baseball players here, I know, and softball players. So this is a happy mom poem. It's called The High Heat. Hovering over a plate of spumoni in the kitchen, I grip the handle of my spoon. A hundred miles away in public housing for seniors, my mother sets, twirls into her wind-up, cocks her arm back and unleashes a wad of bills that she cannot pay from a home shopping network binge, miraculously amassed without a credit card. <laughs> the pitch zooms up and in, the whiskers quiver on my chin. I told you no more curveballs, mom. I kick my spikes into the wood floor but I'm a curveball pitcher, she says, adjusting her cap. <laughs> Gotta love that lady. I'm gonna read a sexy middle-aged poem. Woo! Yeah, baby. 40 is the new 70. <laughs> After an hour on the phone with creditors, your testosterone feels like watered-down lemonade. <laughs> You couldn't impregnate an awkward pause. <laughs> Remember the old days when your wife was belly swollen and you strutted Brooklyn streets with an internal boner twanging against your spleen, imagined being a crop duster filled with semen and pollinating all the women passing in springtime dungarees? <laughs> now you clean greasy spots of masculinity off the tiles and mop on your knees like Cinderella with saggy boobs and a t-shirt that says, used to be one of the fellas. Now the bathroom feels just way too biological. Even in your man cave, you're civilized. To-do lists spray painted on the ceiling. A latex doll wobbling towards you, holding a strap on and a palm full of Rogaine. <laughs> And that's called sexiness. <laughs> oh, here's a weird little poem. <coughs> Conditionals. If you can't take the heat, stay out of the kitchen. If you can't take the kitsch, stay out of the gift shop. If you can't take the guillotine, stay out of the guilt. If you can't take the guilt trip, stay out of the narrative. If you can't take the narcissism, stay out of the mirror. If you can't take the miracle, stay out of the mire. If you can't take the mirage, stay out of the desert. If you can't take the desecration, stay out of the bedroom. If you can't take the bedlam, stay out of the pillbox. If you can't take the pills, stay out of the plunder. If you can't take the plunge, stay out of the chapel. If you can't take the chatter of teeth, stay out of the freezer. If you can't take the freestyle, stead of the cipher. If you can't take the sci-fi, stead of the Spielberg. If you can't take the spiel, stay out of the showroom. If you can't take the shove, stead of the accusation. If you can't take the ache, stead of the land belonging to the heart. Um, here's a poem, I was part of this, like, some guy tried some exercise where he, um, he sent a bunch of people like lines from a Bob Dylan song, Subterranean Homesick Blues, and you just had to write a poem with those since you're jumping off lines. And um, I didn't really know that, where this was going, but it ended up being um, kind of an elegy for a kid I grew up with. Um, it's for Gary Close. Ah, uh, get born, keep warm, short pants, romance, learn to dance circles around the jackals and their polyester grievances, hawking fool's neon like fake watches strapped inside a huckster's overcoat. Hop on the boxcar, baby. We're hitting the rizzoed like a bottle of Martian whiskey. Last week, a cop held a radar gun to my cranium, said my thoughts were going 94 miles an hour over the speed limit. Lately, 
I've been seeing men with shovels lurking behind trees, smoking cigarillos, waiting to seal me in a maple envelope and mail me to the mud. The giant clock on the moon says that I have 7,004 days to live. <coughs> Last week I watched the shovel men slide a kid I grew up with, now 45, into the ground, then start piling dirt when the last tail light of his loved ones flickered away. <coughs> Gary, you fro-headed, no dancing, spiral tossing white boy with a Phillies flag in your casket, you full moon of teeth smiling, leader of our stoop hanging 22nd and Lombard crew with your cut off mesh t-shirts and ready for takeoff tube socks and three Mississippis in a parking lot, you malt liquor swilling, eight ball sinking, drumstick breaking, tainy hating, laying all still in your silk box in the cancerous skin that betrayed you, the word daddy on a banner. At the gravesite, your wife and daughters cried like birds, guarding the entrance of the underworld. And your soul was little chunks of bread being pried from their mouths as the shovel men dropped you down the chute to Hades. Keep warm down there. Skip the romance. If you get reborn this time, learn to dance. <coughs> um, and. Uh, yeah, I'm actually uh, trying to work on this prose book about that street corner, it's 22nd and Lombard, which um, was where we used to hang out, and Gary was the, like the leader of this, of our of our little group. It was like pre pre AIDS, talking late 70s, pre crack, so guns weren't around as much, um, and so pre AIDS also there was a lot of cruising going around there, and there was like a it was like the vortex of a color line. It was on one one block, one way it was all black. Two blocks, another way it was all Irish, and then where where uh, we were was kind of like all, into center city, center city. So it was just this, uh, you know, a, a kind of America that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but anyway, I've been interviewing people from that from that era and trying to make a book out of it. I'm, I'm trying to like make an alumni notes for a street corner, but we'll see. It's another uh, kind of Philly poem about my brother turning um, four. It's called uh, "Youngest Brother Turning 40. I want to say something insightful like you're halfway there on life's circular journey. But life is more like a Jackson Pollock. Little bits of experience randomly splattered over the canvas of your senses. I want to say something clever like if feelings were permanent, tears would stay in our clothing like blood. But the fact is feelings seep inward into the fabric of our spleens. I want to say something wise, like never submit your first emotional draft for publication. <laughs> but the fact is both of our mouths spring open and shut impulsively like mouse traps built into our faces. I want a sentence firm enough to pat myself on the back, like despite it all, I've been a good brother. But the fact is we were never each other's favorites and the ledger of aggressions cannot be wiped clean. I'll always be the one who sold you pot when you were 12 at double the price. <laughs> the one who crowned you with a bowl of cereal. I wanna say something useful like, the trick is seeing the world through stained glass pupils, but some nights the mirror looks as dark as the bags under mom's eyes each morning at the breakfast table as if all the pills she'd been popping had clumped into a hand in her brain, and the hand was applying makeup from within. Okay, I'll read. This is supposed to be a happier poem, <laughs> but I don't know if that's true. It's called uh, Chap, I have this will be, read this one, and then one more, and then I will be uh, into the night, and. Tom will be back up here. One minute you're hissing at your wife about something trivial. The next you're stomping derelict train tracks. When it emerges, it's spires shooting up between your ribs. Your gaze squivels skyward and clutch. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Start over, I think. Well, anyway. Did I say the title of this poem? No. no. Oh, okay. So this t the poem is called Chapel of Inadvertent Joy. 
And it's, um, I got the quote from that, from a, a Mar Marina Svetaiva poem. Uh, I shall lead you, her poem goes, I shall lead you as a guest from another country to the chapel of inadvertent joy where dark gold domes shine and the bells of sleeplessness roar. There from the burgundy clouds, the mother of God will drop her flimsy coat and you will rise, ripe with power, never ashamed that you have loved me. Um, she had a pretty brutal right life. A lot of those Russian poets and artists in the uh, you know, 1920s and 30s had it pretty rough, but uh, hers might have been as bleak as anyone's. Um, so yeah, this poem's Chapel of Inadvertent Joy, and what I take it to mean is kind of those moments of, of beauty that sometimes just appear if we, if, we're open, if we have some part of our eye open a little bit. One minute you're hissing at your wife about something trivial. The next, you're stomping derelict train tracks. When it emerges, its spires shooting up between your ribs. Your gaze swivels skyward and catches a clutch of birds glittering over a smokestack, sparkling back and forth in the sky in various formations, like, like a math equation being worked out in the mind of a genius. Always pull the car over when you spot a teen punk rock show at dusk in a public park. <laughs> Always drink a glimpse of a white horse in a sunlit pasture at the end of summer. Always laugh when the garden hose slips out of your hand and sprays you in the face. When they said, smell the roses, they didn't tell you that every day the rose changes that first you must identify the rose. Today you're in a field by the Hudson River. Ribbons of nectar spool from a folk singer's lips. Your wife and daughter lollygag in the grass. Sunlight drizzles through tree leaves, an organic stained glass window. Feel the convergence of all your stray voltage. Do not pull out of that feeling. Let the father standing next to you see your eyes well up, the inverse of how the neighbors sometimes hear you yelling fuck. It's true, you do not deserve this, but it is yours anyway. The gold-tipped spurs of this moment, a red bird flinging praise through the sky. And, uh, Last poem is um, I, I was at um, the Montauk, you know Montauk out on Long Island. I was out there. It's a pretty beautiful place. It's kind of pricey, but um, there was a lighthouse there, and I started thinking about I don't know the lighthouse and who like would live there and what that would be like. And so I kind of wrote this poem. Um, thanks again, Tom and Travis, uh, for making it happen in Georgia Tech. And again, uh, Vivek really enjoyed that, and John over here. Oh, there. Okay. <laughs> I uh, really enjoyed that. Um, this is called Keeper of the Light. And it, it's a persona poem in the voice of a lighthouse guy. I fork rice and breakfast beans into my mouth. Gnaw a slither of beef rough as a donkey's ear. Then wash it down with boxed apple juice. Read the paper on the sofa. My job does not start till the sun drops to its knees and fires pink arrows into the bellies of clouds. Only then do I climb the 200 stairs, spiraling up through the guts of the tower that from a distance in daylight looks like a brick telescope wedged into the earth. Only then do I load the lamp with whale oil and trim the wick so it burns evenly like a red beard across a pirate's face. Only then do I scrub the layer of carbon off the reflectors and adjust the Fresnel lens, which is like a lampshade made out of shards of an expensive mirror, harnessing the many stems of light into a bouquet to be hurled out in three second intervals. Only then do I turn the short wave to the chatter of ships. Only then binoculars around my neck do I slide open the door and walk the rail 
a salty breeze curling through my pores as I comb the dark waves with my eyes, flag whipping overhead, thunder cooking in clouds. Then the voices start rumbling in. I read you, 13-year-old girl, pinned down by your friend's 19-year-old brother in a basement and excavated as your favorite Crosby, Stills, and Nash song plays cruelly over the speakers. I read you, housewife, with a crushed starfish in your belly, clutching a wine glass like a buoy. I cannot promise help is on the way, but I read you, high school senior, razor marks ricocheting up your forearm. I read you, husband, watching school after school of naughty minnows swim across the screen of your smartphone as the rain gathers around your ankles in the matrimonial rowboat. I read you, 30-year-old woman, smearing kerosene over your breasts like baby oil, a carousel of men assembling, jerking up and down like warped horses on a misery-go-round. I read you, friend from childhood, counting the petals of a daisy. I kill me, I kill me not. I read you, dock worker, wandering the corridors under the ocean's surface, stuffing your unemployment check into the belly button of a slot machine. I read you, 16-year-old girl, getting jabbed with the T in the word slut as you tremble on the train platform and lean back into the broad metal arms of eternity. I read you and chart your coordinates, note your howls, and know I cannot save you or, or bring supplies. Just sit inside this giant candle and fling thimbles of light in your direction, whispering, I hear you, hold tight. <laughs>